Truth Espresso, episode 262. Face it, we all would rather sleep in this morning. <sighs> That's why God gave us espresso, to kickstart our zombified corpses into hyperdrive. <laughs> and now, giving your mind and soul the morning shot of truth it craves. <sighs> this is Truth Espresso with Daniel Minnick. Hello there, friends, family, foes, and lurkers alike. This is your host, Daniel Minnick. And back with me after a few episodes, kind of break while she was doing a lot of um, ministry-related stuff on weekends, is my sweet, beautiful wife and co-host, Chelsea. And so, welcome back to Truth Espresso, sweetheart. Thank you for doing this with me. Yes, it's good to be back. And so since you are back, we can continue a series that we were doing a few weeks ago on answering the question, who are the Nephilim? If you recall, we did two episodes on that, presenting two different theories on who are the Nephilim, which ties with who are the sons of God mentioned in Genesis 6-2. If the sons of God were fallen angels or angels that fell in this process, then the Nephilim are usually considered the offspring of the fallen angels and human beings. And then the Nephilim become superhuman giants. And often I've read on this theory that they could have been like 90 feet tall or something. These were like the titans of Greek mythology, basically. And then the second theory is called the Sethite view, which presents the idea that the sons of God were from the line of Seth, intermarrying with the daughters of men being the daughters, women from the line of Cain. And so this compromised the faith. And so the Nephilim may or may not have been their offspring, but the Nephilim were maybe giants in a lesser uh, sense than that of the angelic view. They could have been large, but they could have been giants in a metaphorical sense or that of accomplishment and so on. But now we get to the third view, and that the sons of God were wicked rulers and the daughters of men were not so rulers. <laughs> Women who were basically peasantry The sons of God were evil rulers who took peasant women by force. And so why would these rulers be called the sons of God? That's kind of an interesting theory about that. One explanation for that is that back in ancient cultures, rulers of cities, by kind of legend that developed over time, they would be considered deities. And so what does this theory promote? What was the actual sin? Sweetheart, you want to address that? Because what was the sin in the angelic view? And then what was the sin in the Sethite view? And then what's the sin for which God judged the world in the flood in this view that the sons of God were wicked rulers taking wives from the daughters of men, the peasantry? Well, in a broad sense, it seems like all three categories are similar in that each group did not follow what God commanded. Like God designed marriage to be between one man and one woman. We see with the wicked rulers, they're forcing and taking typically multiple women. And then with our fallen angels, their disobedience to God is they were trying to be like God, so they were fallen from that. And then with the Sethites, God commanded them not to marry outside the lineage of Seth. And so if they were disobeying God and marrying into the lineage of Cain, then that's another example of disobedience towards God. You mentioned all three of them. Of course, the sin has to do with compromising and not in marriage or relationships and not following God's way with the angelic view. It's supposed to be like, you've got to stick to the same species. 
<laughs> if you can do this at all. And then the Sethite view is now some people might take that as well. The descendants of Seth had to stay within their own bloodline, and others adherents to that might say, well, it wasn't necessarily the bloodline; it was compromising faith and virtue with those who didn't follow the same faith and virtue. And then on this one, the sin was that of compulsion and polygamy. And some people who hold to this view make polygamy the reason for the flood. And I'm saying polygamy was involved, but I could suggest maybe that wasn't the only reason for it. (laughs) It was a symptom of it. So the primary sin was forced marriage and polygamy in this view. And if we look at Genesis chapter 4, the last time we saw the line of Cain, we see the example of Lamech. He was the first example of a descendant of Cain who practiced polygamy. Genesis 4 verses 19 through 24, where he tells his two wives that he was guilty of killing Whether it's one man or two men, if you take the statements, I killed a a man to my wounding and a young man to my hurt. If they're the same man, it's one. If they're different, it's two. You know, some traditions will have, and I think I'll mention that later, you know, that whether it's he killed Cain and he also killed a descendant of Cain and so on. But whatever the case Lamech is an example of practicing polygamy, and maybe this was a kind of leading up to as the descendants of Cain or what have you spread, and then those who formed cities, rulers, started taking wives of peasantry and taking multiple wives just hey, you've got to come and be part of my harem, basically. And they had no choice, and God basically said, that's it, this is not how I determine marriage to be. There's so much wickedness and polygamy and non-commitment and so on that that was the reason for the flood or one of the reasons. Only that's kind of hard to grasp that that would be the only reason for the flood because, I mean, I understand that polygamy is kind of the breakdown of what God designed in a marriage, but it just seems like there's so much more wicked things that were going on that (laughs) would be more cause for the flood. But like you said, this just (laughs) is part of it. (laughs) Yeah, it's kind of almost like an understatement synecdoche for the whole problem. So let's get into some arguments for this theory, and I admit as I was trying to research this particular theory, it's very hard to find, first of all, anything that mentions it. It's usually just the first two views we mentioned. And second of all, those who do mention it might mention in passing, talking about how it's a very minority view and almost not worth even discussing. And so let's discuss it in this episode. Maybe we can dig up some things that would be some scriptural or logical support for this view. And so the first argument in favor of the wicked rulers getting wives or concubines or whatever by force, by compulsion, is that scriptures often show pagan rulers thinking of themselves as gods. So this is in support of calling wicked rulers sons of God. Not that they were sons of God Most High, the God Yahweh that we regard, but how they're regarded guarded in culture and given the title sons of gods by pagans so some examples of that that we see in scripture is that the pharaoh was considered in ancient egypt one of the gods God told Moses that he would make him like a god to Pharaoh, probably because Pharaoh wouldn't regard anything less <laughs> than that. Like, hey, if you want to persuade me, you have to be like on par with me who am a god, and so you've got to be a god to me. And we see that in Exodus 7, 1, where it says, And the Lord, or Yahweh, said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Mm -hmm. Now, this doesn't mean that Yahweh is telling Moses that he made him ontologically a god. 
He's saying, in the mind of Pharaoh, I'm going to make you as if you were a god, the way Pharaoh thinks of gods, and that Aaron, being his mouthpiece, would be like, here's the prophet of that god. So, sweetheart, what's another scriptural support for this idea of rulers being regarded as gods in Canaanite culture? So in Ezekiel, we have the example of the king of Tyre, where he thought he was a god. In Ezekiel 28, verse 2, it says, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a god. I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas. Yet thou art a man, and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. In verse 9, Wilt thou yet say before him that slayeth thee, I am God? But thou shalt be a man, and no God, in the hand of him that slayeth thee. There's another example, and it seems like a lot of Canaanite kings, just like Egypt to the south. You have Tyre here, like they all surrounding Israel, they all seem to think that they were some form of deity. And then we have later in Ezekiel, and I think this might even be Pharaoh Necho in a, a previous episode, I was talking about the Assyrians and <laughs> the threat that they posed to Israel and Pharaoh Necho. So I mentioned in this episode that the Pharaoh of Egypt was considered a god. Now, after the Pharaoh to which Moses spoke, hundreds of years later, you have in Ezekiel 32, verse 21, it says, the strong among the mighty shall speak to him out of the midst of hell, or the grave there, with them that help him. They are gone down, they lie uncircumcised, slain by the sword. So this is a word from God to Pharaoh regarding Pharaoh. God said to Pharaoh that the mighty gods, the English here, the strong among the mighty, is the Ele Giborim, the mighty gods, it's the same words that you see in Isaiah chapter 10. It says that the people of Israel will return to the mighty God. You know, this is the plural form of it. So the mighty gods, or those who are regarded, the mighty men, the mighty warriors and kings, they shall speak to Pharaoh out of the midst of the grave. So kind of as a testimony like, hey, you're going to join us here. You're going to die. You're going to be slain by the sword. So God's telling Pharaoh, who thinks he's one of the gods, that, hey, all these mighty gods from the grave, that just like you were, who thought they were something, and they are there slain by the sword in battle, you're going to join them, and they're going to call out unto you, like, hey, come join us here in the grave. Yeah, especially in that culture, they thought that there was a way to preserve their body. And yeah. with all the mummification and stuff, they went into so much detail with that because they thought they could prolong life and you could live forever. And so when God comes and says, no, you can't live forever in this mortal body. And I think that had to have been pretty intense for Pharaoh here to hear that mm. and be like, oh, we don't get to live forever. There's people that have gone before us that will actually like cry from their graves. I know that with ancient Canaanite cultures, some of them were more centered on this life. All of them had ideas of gods and afterlife, but say like the ancient Greek and Roman cultures, even though they had tales about afterlife, the primary focus was this life. And I think the same with the Assyrians. But with the Egyptian culture, the primary focus was preserving and preparing for their understanding of the afterlife. And so as you mentioned, mummification, there is so much focus in Egyptian culture on how do we make this life prepare for the next, but not in the biblical sense. So, sweetheart, and we have one more example from Scripture, and this is from Israel where the rulers are considered gods. Yeah, so God is telling the judges of Israel, who kind of viewed themselves as gods, needed to humble themselves. And we see in Psalms 82, verse 1, it says, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. And then in verse 6, I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. In verse 7, but ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. 
And that sounds eerily similar to God's message to Pharaoh that we mentioned above. You think you're gods, but you're going to fall like men. And the king of Tyre, too, yeah. So even to the Israelite judges, who are called them the Elohim there, God rules in the midst of the Elohim, and he tells them, I've said you're gods, and you're children of God. So here we have another example of kind of the sons of God, similar to the last episode. I think we mentioned the passage here. But telling these ones, these rulers who consider themselves Elohim, that they will die like men. Hello, I'm Melba Toast, host of Thoroughly Equipped, a podcast for women centered on Sola Scriptura, the doctrine that the scriptures are all we need for salvation and spiritual living. This podcast takes the popular evangelical women's ministry teachings and philosophies and compares them to scripture to show just how sufficient it is to thoroughly equip and train us to be women who glorify God in all we do, trust in Christ and all he has done, and to live out and proclaim the gospel day by day. So I hope you'll tune in to Thoroughly Equipped, which you can find on most podcast apps, Striving for Eternity's Christian podcast community, or look me up on the web at ttew.org. So that was the first argument for the wicked ruler's view of the sons of God. And the second argument is that scriptures show powerful rulers taking wives by force or influence whom they choose. So those who find power over other people tend to have their pick of women. And often men, they'll get younger women, they'll get many women. And they get what they want. They don't have to ask for it, especially the pagan ones. And so doesn't this sound eerily similar to like what we see in our culture today (laughs) where people in power think that in not necessarily in power, but where people are puffed up and have that pride that they can get whatever they want or also that they are somehow owed whatever they want to even to the extent of violating God's laws. So whether it's stealing or adultery or Mm. even killing, there's so much sin involved with that issue of pride and feeling like, okay, they're this big something. They're these mini gods. They can have whatever they want and take it however they want to. And I don't know, we see a lot of that today. And it's sad like okay that still affects us as people and that we think that we are these like many gods <laughs> reminds me of the poem ozymandias to reflect the idea yeah every period of history has these people who these kings who think they're ultimate and yet they just become part of the ruins of history And yeah, even today we see rulers and politicians that they find power, they grasp onto it like monkeys holding onto things in a cage. They will not let them go. It's a very difficult thing for people who find power to lose it because they can take advantage of it. And just like the wicked rulers at this time, one of those things is to have licit relationships and the top pick of the litter or something as you you might call it, and scriptures show these rulers taking wives that they choose, and we see one example early on in scripture because there was twice recorded in Genesis where Abram and his wife Sarai had to go to Egypt, and when they're in Egypt, Abram fears that the Pharaoh is going to take his wife away from him. And so he tells her to lie that she's a brother and not to say that uh, she's married to him because then the Pharaoh would kill him to get her. And yeah, so the Pharaoh exercised and had the power to take Abram's wife, Sarai, by force. And he did that one time. And so God judged him and threatened him. And Pharaoh had to tell Abram, like, why didn't you tell me that she was your wife? And what's another example of that, sweetheart? Yeah, probably one that comes to our mind just thinking about taking women by force is King David when he takes Bathsheba and goes even as far as to killing her husband because he had that just overwhelming (laughs) sense of authority and power that like I want that and I'm going to have it and it doesn't matter what I need to do to get that. 
But don't you think of like some of the things that are happening in the news right now with some of I can't think of the name of the island where all these Epstein Island. Yes. Yeah. Where like all these people higher up and I mean just mm. even thinking about some of the yeah, trafficking, trafficking that yeah. we have going on where people are they're not necessarily in high government authority with us, but there's people that use their power of persuasion or power of promises or like, oh, I, we can get you to America and give you freedom. But at the cost of we're going to be selling you and you're going to be abused and yeah. like power corrupts oh, so yes. quickly <laughs> and Definitely. so easily. And that's just something that I mean, going through this, these verses and seeing all the corruption that comes from this sense of being a God wow, we really need to (laughs) reflect on that and guard our hearts and our minds from becoming like that and thinking that we are all that and we deserve this no matter what and like humbling ourselves before God that no, that is not who he calls us to be. You mentioned the island and the horrors of the island there and that's another example, the girls there. It's not like they're dignitaries themselves, but People with power, you know, if that's an example of what was going on in Genesis 6 with this interpretation, then yeah, that is pretty wicked. And so, yeah, that is a good example because wicked rulers tend to use their power in very not nice ways. And we mentioned the example of David. He's called a man after God's own heart, but even power gets to him. And all he had to do was tell his servants, go tell her that the king has need of you. Okay, the king wants to see me, you know, and then he gets what he wants at the time. So even a otherwise godly king runs into trouble with this. And then another example is King Solomon. And here's a big example because Solomon was blessed by God with both wisdom and riches. And because of the power he had, so much so that all these nations around him marveled and visited a lot. And so he had so much sway and influence over other nations. And the scriptures mention all kinds of stuff that was imported into Israel from other countries shipped in. Solomon, as king, had the power and influence to have 700 wives and 300 concubines. So, yeah, this is yet another example of kings, rulers with power, using that to multiply wives that they chose. How do you keep track of all of those? Uh, yeah, I'm sure he, he probably didn't. <laughs> you know, yeah. someone else probably kept track of that, you know. So one of the other examples I was thinking of that I don't see on our list here is Jacob, because he had quite a few wives, too. And that, <laughs> He had at well, least well, two. two. Yeah, Leah and Rachel. Yeah, but that caused a lot of... Um, I mean, he had to work for his. He wasn't yeah. really a ruler, but it shows the problem of polygamy <laughs> in yeah. general, how it causes problems with marriage and strife. And But it was still like, I mean, I know the father-in-law kind of tricked him with Rachel, but it was like, okay, he wasn't content with what he wanted something, and he was going to get that no matter what, to some extent. I mean, he didn't kill anyone, but still, it's kind of like, I think that... And I don't know if you find this, but I think how God made men, he made men to be leaders and to have that type of authority, but then to also understand that your authority is still under God. Like, yes. So it seems like it's very easy for men to be mm. like, oh, okay, since I am the leader, I do have the final say or authority to kind of take and run with that instead of being like, oh, no, wait, I still am under God and he's the ultimate authority. So that's something that we should do as wives is pray for our husbands that they have that humility to understand like where that authority is still accountable towards God and just like praying that God will protect our husbands and help them not get swayed into having anything and everything they want. And thank you, sweetheart, for praying for me too. And definitely even as a thinking of any nation, scripture says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. 
any nation who culturally gets to the point where they believe that they're not under God's law, they're the ultimate authority, as we're constantly hammered on with propaganda today, that the state is the ultimate authority and a secularized state, that we see all kinds of debauchery come from that. Now, sweetheart, what's another example in the scripture? Because it seems like there's quite a few. I'm sure I'm going to mess up his name. King Ahar- uh, Ahasuerus. Ahasuerus. Yes. <laughs> I'm like, I look at it and I think, oh, okay, I can say this. King Ahasuerus compelled the kingdom to produce women from whom he would choose a wife which ultimately turned out to be Esther the Jew. Yeah, so we, when we read the story, we might not think too much about this as an example, but hey, yeah, he sent out a decree, you know, you got to bring all the eligible maidens, like you have Cinderella, <laughs> there's going to be a ball and every eligible maiden is to attend, you know, it's kind of a more civilized, formal way, but thinking of the veggie tales, of uh, that's kind of like a America's Got Talent type of <laughs> thing, <laughs> where they're all auditioning to be the new wife there, <laughs> But yeah, King Ahasuerus, the ruler of the power at the time, is like, hey, he ended up casting out his wife because she didn't show up at his banquet. And so, wait a minute, now I need a new wife. Well, any woman in the kingdom is technically available. He doesn't have to search and impress. It's just, you got to show up and I pick one. <laughs> so, wife, which I chose. So the first point, scriptures show pagan rulers thinking of themselves as gods, so that's support for them being called sons of God. Second point, scriptures show the rulers taking wives by force or influence whom they chose. And then the third scriptural support is often the term for mighty, gibor, gibberim in Hebrew there, associated with God or gods can often denote powerful humans. So therefore, the Nephilim as mighty men, Giborim, doesn't have to imply that they were supernatural offspring. Now, of course, that could be support for the Sethite view too. In Genesis 10, verses 8 through 9, it says, And Cush begot Nimrod, he began to be a mighty one, Gibor in the earth. He was a mighty Gibor hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty Gibor hunter before the Lord. So three times there we see the word for Gibor referring to a mighty person. In Isaiah 9, 6, the son that's going to be born is mentioned as going to be a mighty God, El Gibor. But Gibor, mighty, as these Nephilim are called in Genesis 6, because they're called mighty men, that doesn't necessarily mean they're supernatural. They could be just mighty men. And Nimrod is an example of that. And so if the Nephilim don't have to be supernatural or demigods, then they don't have to be the offspring of angels and humans and so on. And This is kind of random, but <laughs> wouldn't that be cool to have a kid named Nimrod? <laughs> or would they be teased <laughs> oh yeah it's funny like now I, I i hear people use the name nimrod as kind of making fun of someone like it's kind of weird like so nimrod you know almost like dimwit or something i've heard the name nimrod used as kind of a slur on someone <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think it's a cool yeah, name and that is. he's a mighty hunter. Like, <laughs> yeah. We're too far away from the letter N in our family <laughs> to <laughs> name any kids with Nimrod. <laughs> That's okay. We'll name stuffed animals Nimrod. <laughs> that there sounds like a, a plan. <laughs> and then you can make your stuffed animals mighty warriors too. Yes. <laughs> So, sweetheart, what's a fourth supporting point from Scripture? Arguments for the sons of God being wicked rulers. Yeah, so our fourth argument for this is that Scriptures chronicle how the descendants of Cain became mighty, both culturally and materially, and they became quite accustomed to violence. So, using force and war and threats to overtake. 
So Cain went from the presence of the Lord, and he built a city. And that's referenced in Genesis 4.17. And Cain's descendant, Jabal, seemed to build a cattle empire. (laughs) And we see that in Genesis 4.20. And then Jabal's brother, Jubal, started a music empire in Genesis 4.21. And then their half-brother, Tubalcane, started a metal smithing empire that likely led to weapons and armor. And that's in verse 22 of Genesis 4. Their father, Lemek, also confessed to having killed someone. So some traditions, including the Book of Jasher forgery, hold that he was with his son, Tubalcan, and killed his ancestor, Cain, by accident as he was hunting, thinking it was an animal. And out of fear and desperation, he killed his son, Tubalcan, who was a witness. Then he lamented to his two wives that he had killed these two men. So we see, as the scriptures chronicle the line of Cain, we see they become very advanced very quickly. There's lots of talent there. There's empires, cattle, music, metallurgy, and hunting. But then we also see violence happening. So Cain killed Abel, and then it seems like violence kind of went down their lineage there, where Lamech killed people, and metallurgy seemed to be focused on preparing for war there. We'll provide a link to the book of Jasher that proposes to be the book of Jasher that's mentioned. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? It's regarded to be a forgery. So while Cain's line became culturally mighty but wicked, nothing is said of culture or material accomplishments in Seth's line. So when you see then began men to call upon the name of the Lord in Seth's line, it seems like they're all they're agrarian, they're preachers, but there's nothing about he became mighty in this. Like Cain's line, there's no mention of talents and such. They most likely were simple agrarians enduring what it says in Genesis 5 29 our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed so when God cursed Adam out of the sweat of your brow it seems like the line of Seth endured that the most if anyone else happened to be like Enoch if Enoch was an example of what others might have been like in the line of Seth they would have been humble preachers There was no worldly glory to be had in the line of Seth. Unlike the line of Cain, they became mighty in talents and empires and stuff and building cities. But we see violence creeping into Cain's line. And so that seems to lead to those who would become powerful rulers of cities and so on, just building up their own personal harems, taking wives that they choose by force and threats of violence. Are you living an abundant life? Jesus came to give us eternal life, yes, but also an abundant life here and now, overflowing with the fruit of the Spirit. The Abundant Life Podcast encourages and challenges Christians to spiritual change and growth by applying biblical principles to everyday life. Podcast hosts Sasso Mendez and Ben Ariano discuss various topics that are helpful for Christians and true to the Scripture and bring a generous dose of humor. Visit AbundantLife.fm and subscribe to get notified of each new episode. That's AbundantLife.fm. Oh yeah, and since I mentioned the Book of Jasher forgery, so the Book of Jasher forgery here, and it kind of tries to be like its own version of the Book of Genesis, and it has some very interesting reading in places. What I think what's funny is how it accounts for the story of Joseph in Egypt and Potiphar's wife. It gives a lot more detail about her pursuits of Joseph and her intense struggles with... <laughs> dealing with him it's almost like a diary of that (laughs) but the book of jasher expresses the wicked ruler's view of the sons of god and the daughters of men so the book of jasher 418 says and their judges and rulers went to the daughters of men and took their wives by force from their husbands according to their choice 
And the sons of men in those days took from the cattle of the earth the beasts of the field and the fowls of the air and taught the mixture of animals of one species with the other in order therewith to provoke the Lord. And God saw the whole earth and it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted its ways upon the earth, all men and all animals. So this book of Jasher forgery interprets the sons of God referring to judges and rulers, and they took wives by force from their husbands. So there's one example of this interpretation. We talked about arguments for, and quickly we could get to arguments against. And arguments against this view, there can be made arguments against it, even from the first view, the fallen angels. Arguments against the Sethite view, many of them can apply to this view from the pro-angel evidence view. But there's a few that can be specifically applied to this one. So, sweetheart, do you want to talk about the first argument against this view of the wicked rulers? So we kind of touched on this a little bit earlier. The first argument against it is talking about would widespread polygamy or polyamory really result in the kind of sin that God would end up flooding the entire world? So it seems like God tolerated polygamy later, and it was common among the Canaanite nations and even with some otherwise righteous rulers of Israel, like we mentioned David and Solomon. That was not God's preference in not how God designed marriage, but at the same time, we didn't see God like destroying the entire nation for mm. just that practice. So this one is like, is that enough of a sin that he would send the flood? And if he sent the flood for it before saying that it repented me that I created mankind. And then yet after the flood, we have, you could take any Canaanite nation. They're probably like that. They practice polygamy and polyamory, multiple wives, whether they even consider marriage at all, just anything goes in that regard. Would polygamy really be, do we see God destroying nations, destroying Sodom and Gomorrah? That wasn't just for polygamy. There was a whole lot more for why God sent fire and brimstone in Sodom and Gomorrah. And since just about every Canaanite nation practiced this, and then we see it become part of Israel too, God promised he wouldn't destroy the earth with a flood, but he could have destroyed the earth with some other means if that was the really the reason he destroyed it with a flood in the first place. Mm-hmm. But what about the fact that maybe this was compelled a lot? So although judgments happened, Pharaoh taking Sarai, David taking Bathsheba demonstrate how common the situation has occurred. Why wouldn't God ethnically cleanse the world some other way since the flood? Polygamy, yeah, maybe that's not enough. But what about compelled polygamy? Well, we see examples of that. God did judge David for what he did with Bathsheba and having his son die. But there was no big ethnic cleansing going on here. And a lot of other kings did things. And yeah, maybe they lost an eye or fell to the sword. But God didn't wipe out the nation for it. And Mm -hmm. Maybe there just wasn't enough of it or what, but, you know, it seems like it was pretty prevalent. And so that's one challenge for this view. Why was it such a horrendous thing if it was just polygamy or compelled polygamy, compelled marriages that God wiped out the earth except for Noah and his family because of that? It's worth answering. And now, a second argument against the wicked ruler's compelled polygamy view is that although some considered rulers gods, there doesn't seem to be much evidence in history or historical writings that pagan rulers were called sons of gods. You know, so we did present a lot of evidence that they were considered deities, but do we really have a lot of extant evidence that they were considered sons? of deities. Now, a pharaoh, for example, who he has a son who becomes the next pharaoh, and a pharaoh's regarded as God, well then, a god, then, well then, his son who becomes the next pharaoh would be the son of a god. But it's just hard to find any historical evidence that rulers were called sons of gods. 
a sweetheart what's the last and final you know not that this could possibly be the only argument against it but what's the last one that we have so yeah our third argument against it is that it suffers from the same challenges that we saw with the sethite view looking at jude 6 and second peter 2 4 those both seem to strongly suggest and also the book of enoch plainly teaches that angels had relations with humans and that this was related to God's judgment with the flood. So just like the Sethite view, it's like this view still has to answer and deal with those challenges. And so if Second Peter, we gave some strong arguments from those passages when talking about the fallen angel view, well, this view has that same challenge. And So just like the Sethite view, it has to figure out a similar answer to those passages that, well, they aren't talking about angels having relations with humans and so on and still has to deal with the book of Enoch and try to argue that, well, Jude wasn't referencing the book of Enoch or if he was, maybe the parts of the book of Enoch I was reading that there are some historians who suggest that parts of the book of Enoch were written later, which includes the part that talks about the angels intermarrying with humans part. And so maybe Jude did not know about that when he was referencing what could have been something claiming to be the book of Enoch that eventually got merged together with other writings to be what we have today called the book of Enoch. There's all ways you can answer that, but it's still a challenge for this view to answer. So that was a third view. I think we did a good job trying to figure out evidence for how you can consider the sons of God as wicked rulers the daughters of men being women who were not of high pedigree and that they were pickings for the wicked rulers and by wives which they chose it could have been women who were already married to peasant men and the wicked rulers just basically say hey if i want you you will come and not just one and not necessarily engaging in marriage ceremonies either. It's just, hey, you come and I have what I want. And yeah, we see a lot of evidence in scripture for rulers doing that kind of thing. We see a lot of evidence of rulers considering themselves gods, being called gods by their culture. But there are questions, just like with any theory of how to interpret these strange verses in Genesis chapter 6. And so we presented three views because understanding sons of God, daughters of men, Nephilim, the mighty men, men of old, men of renown that there's a debate that rages on and we could come up with our own view of how to understand this which we might do in another episode if we try to say hey if you've listened to these three episodes you might be asking well you presented arguments for and against in three different views well what do you believe about these verses yeah that was my question for <laughs> yeah, exactly. you <laughs> <laughs> so what do we believe about these verses well you just might have to tune in for another episode where we might tell you hey this is what it means or you know maybe we <laughs> might have to say that the debate rages on oh man you're gonna leave a cliffhanger <laughs> of course but that's okay. this is how tv series get you tuned into the next episode and this <laughs> is how we here at truth espresso can get you to tune into the next episode of truth espresso and the next one in this series if that is indeed next week or any following week but we will strive to come up with an episode in which we will present a possible solution to this so you'll have to stay tuned for the next episode of Truth Espresso and God bless thank you for waking up with Truth Espresso good morning and God bless your day hey friends Daniel Minnick here again 
If you liked waking up to this episode of Truth Espresso, I would really appreciate it if you would rate it on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or whatever application you use to listen to Truth Espresso.